Hello, everyone. My name is Darcy Ovalles, and I am a junior in Polly Murray College, majoring in philosophy, as well as a student tour guide for the Yale Center for British Art here in New Haven. While we are under renovation, I'm thrilled to have you all here today as we explore the connections between art, colonialism, and cartography in the context of Britain and the New World. Our inquiry will extend beyond mere observation to critical analysis as we explore the ways in which maps serve as instruments of imperial control and how they continue to influence perceptions and realities in the present. This tour proposes to challenge conventional narratives by contextualizing colonial maps within broader historical and social frameworks, ultimately revealing the inherent politics and complexities embedded within cartographic representations. So without further ado, let's start on this tour where every stroke of the brush and contour of the land invites us to interrogate and reimagine the Caribbean and North America's past, present, and future. To begin, this painting I will be showing you is titled A Bird's Eye View of the Island of Barbados by Dutch painter Isaac Sailmaker in 1694. Sailmaker, who settled in England, actually never visited the uh, Barbados or the West Indies. He actually made this painting based on other plans and maps of the land. Features of the painting include a seemingly untouched Barbados at first human contact. This aerial perspective, though not technologically feasible during the era in which the painting was created, serves as a powerful artistic device that transcends representation of physical reality. Rather than presenting a strictly factual depiction of the scene, this painting offers a metaphorical vantage point imbued with significance. This perspective evokes the concept of the all-seeing eye, suggesting a sense of omniscience and omnipotence that transcends human limitations. From this elevated viewpoint, the viewer is granted a sweeping panoramic vision of the landscape below instilling a sense of authority and control over the terrain. However, this sense of omnipotence also underscores a hierarchical imbalance inherent in the relationship between the artist and the depicted scene. While the artist may revel in the godlike perspective afforded by this painting, it also serves as a stark reminder of the power dynamics at play. The artist assumes a position of dominance over the landscape, reinforcing notions of colonial superiority and control. This hierarchical imbalance is further accentuated by the absence of distinguishable human figures within the sea, emphasizing the depersonalized and objectified nature of the land below. In the late 16th and early 17th centuries, perspective mapping became an established tradition in Europe. These maps typically portrayed places of high political or commercial importance, like Barbados, providing British audiences, mostly travelers, with a unique aerial perspective. So this painting visually depicts the transformation of Barbados' geography due to the creation of sugar plantations in 1694. Sugar not only altered the physical landscape, which isn't really shown in this painting, but it also had profound social, political, and economic impacts. Many details in this painting, though, offer a snapshot of this island in this sort of transitional period. Such an example of a detail are these palm trees that seem to sway gently in the breeze as we see here. Amidst this landscape, small and sparse houses dot the horizon, a testament to the humble beginnings of English settlement that took root around 1627. These dwellings constructed from native materials blend harmoniously with the natural surroundings, 
The blend of the foliage and the houses serve as a representation that the land was just untouched before European settlements awaiting their arrival. It also seems to represent that the process of settling was as harmonious and peaceful as the blend of the houses within these trees. The tranquility of this seemingly idyllic scene is soon shattered by the silhouette of ships on the horizon. These vessels carry within them the dawn of a new era, settlers eager to carve out their destiny in this untamed land, and as well as supplies vital for the establishment of such a colony. At colonial contact, the forests easily fall to make way for the relentless advance of civilization. It gives rise to vast expanses of sugarcane fields that stretch as far as the eye can see. In this painting, however, the forest remains untouched. Along the coast, this painting also shows settlers and indigenous people working harmoniously in the development of Barbados. In reality, Africans and indigenous folk labor side by side, and they later become the backbone of Barbados's sugar industry through oppressive labor. As we transition to, the, to this image from 1694, showing mostly the island of Barbados as it was at the dawn of settler, of settler arrival and the beginning of European transformation to accommodate large-scale sugar farming, we will also explore how maps from before the first English settlements came to be. This following map is titled The Map of North America from Florida to Chesapeake Bay, after the original by John White in the British Museum. Though we do not know exactly when this map was made, we know that John White was an English cartographer active from 1585 to 1593. John White was a prominent figure in the Age of Exploration, documenting the lands he encountered and providing valuable insights into the geography, flora, fauna, and indigenous people. Due to White's travels, his drawings were the most accurate visual record of the New World by an artist of his entire generation. There are many things here that draw your attention to this map that make it so different from other maps that you may be used to seeing. The inclusion of these whimsical depictions of animals are a big departure from the typical topographic details that one might expect from a map. Among these whimsical additions are these renditions of manatees, dolphins, and other fish. What captivates the viewer's attention is not just the presence of these creatures, but also the manner in which they are depicted. Their forms exude a sense of fun. Their proportions are exaggerated and larger than life, deviating from strict adherence to the scale. These playful additions inject the map with a sense of vitality and wonder, inviting the viewer to explore beyond the confines of tra traditional cartographic representation. In doing so, this map transcends its utilitarian purpose, transforming into a work of art that sparks imagination and curiosity. Through the inclusion of these fantastical elements, the map not only navigates physical geography, but also deviates from standard conventions of art cartography. As a result, the map makers conve conveyed a sense of appreciation for the Caribbean's unique ecosystem and wildlife. However, this map can also be interpreted with an air of exoticization of the Caribbean, portraying it as an alluring and mysterious paradise that captivated the minds of Europeans. The colorful animals um, also add that element of romanticization or idealizing a place that is usually perceived as strange or unfamiliar at this time. 
embellishing this map with vibrant colors like red, orange, and blue, as well as these intricate illustrations of exotic animals, this enticed settlers to embark on these voyages to this newfound land, and it served to highlight the perceived abundance and diversity of resources awaiting exploitation. Notice as well that this map lacks proper labels for cities and roads. This serves as a reminder of the colonial mindset that prevailed during this era of British exploration and colonization in the Caribbean and North America. By neglecting to provide detailed geographical information beyond the natural features of the landscape, this map perpetuates a Eurocentric perspective that viewed the region primarily through the lens of resource extraction. Set against this backdrop of a seemingly quote unquote untouched paradise, such as we saw on the last painting as well, this map's lack of comprehensive labels reinforces the notion of the Caribbean as a clean slate upon which European powers could impose their will and extract riches without consideration for the indigenous cultures and societies that had long inhabited and shaped the region. In omitting the names and landmarks that would demonstrate human habitation and activity, these maps effectively erased the presence and contributions of indigenous people, relegating them to the periphery of colonial consciousness. As we continue our exploration, we'll turn our attention to our last remarkable object. This map is titled North America and the West Indies, a new map, wherein the British Empire and its limits, according to the definitive Treaty of Peace in 1763, are accurately described in the dominions possessed by the Spaniards, the French, and other European states. Quite a mouthful. This map, printed for Carrington Bowles in London around 1764, provides a fascinating glimpse into the expanding knowledge of the land resulting from colonial settlements during the 18th century. Color-coded to distinguish the territories of Spain, France, and England, with yellow representing Spain, green representing France, and red representing Britain, this map vividly illustrates the geopolitical landscape of the time. This map also seems to be more like a map that you are used to seeing, with some embellishments here and there. Typical geographical markers um, are included, such as a compass seen in the center of the map and a cartographic scale seen at the bottom right-hand corner of the map. The land depicted also is very clearly an outline of a current map of North America and the Caribbean, a silhouette that we are all familiar with. This map represents a very big departure from the whimsical and imaginative qualities of the other map. In contrast to the previous map, this map is characterized by a wealth of detailed information, as we can see in this detailed photograph here. These more detailed representations reflect the changing attitudes and priorities of British map makers over time. By 1763, the British Empire had established a firmer foothold in the Caribbean and North America leading to a greater familiarity with the land and its features. This increased knowledge is reflected in the meticulous cartography of this map, which strives for accuracy and precision in its portrayal of territorial boundaries, political divisions, and natural landscapes. Unlike the earlier map, which seemed to view the Caribbean primarily through the lens of imagination and idealization, this map represents a more grounded and detailed understanding of the region's geography. This inclusion of detailed labels and the delineation of territorial boundaries 
serve to convey a sense of authority and control, reflecting Europe's growing dominance in the region following the conclusion of the Seven Years' War. One striking feature of this map is the inclusion of figures representing peace that you see here on the left-hand side of the slide. A man and a woman adorned in drapes of red, yellow, and green, all three colors represented by Britain, Spain, and France. You can also see them wearing beaded necklaces, armbands, and other jewelry, and accessorized headbands with feathers showcasing the benefits and wealth gained from these newly acquired lands. These figures not only signify the resolution of conflict, but also subtly communicate the underlying narrative of possession that underscored colonial um, endeavors. The beaded necklaces, armbands, jewelry, and feathered headbands worn by these figures can be interpreted as tokens of the economic exploitation and cultural appropriation inherent in colonial conquests. These adornments, while on the surface celebrating the wealth and benefits acquired from colonial territories, also serve as reminders of the costs at which these gains came, often at the expense of indigenous populations and natural resources. Another feature of this map is an excerpt of the treaty itself, um, which is placed on the left-hand side of the map and the right-hand side of this slideshow. Apologies for the lack of detail shown in this image, but in summary, the treaty indicates which lands, quote unquote, belonged to whom. Spain secured control over the port of New Orleans and the vast Louisiana territory west of the Mississippi, including the present day Dominican Republic. France retained its holdings in quote unquote, New France, spanning parts of present day Canada. Meanwhile, Britain expanded its dominions to include territories such as Jamaica, Florida, New York, and South Carolina. The inclusion of the treaty on this map legitimize colonial rule and expansion under the guise of bringing peace and civilization. In summary, I have shown you three pieces. And in these pieces, I have shown the evolution of depictions of the quote unquote new world and how they reflect the changing relationship between these lands and England over time. These pieces also delve deeper into the role of maps in constructing and perpetuating imperial narratives by recontextualizing maps from the colonial period. These map makers each presented a distinct political narrative through their work. The sailmaker piece depicts Barbados as a smooth and uncontested acquisition for English settlers. The map, inspired by John White's drawings, portrays the New World as a blank, yet-to-be-discovered territory. Lastly, the map for Bulls, made in 1764, is a portrayal of the land as a possession, carved up and distribu distributed among colonial powers. All of these perspectives collectively diminish the agency and narratives of the indigenous people and those most intimately connected with the land, at times perpetuating a distorted version of history. It is important to recognize that maps, despite their appearance of objectivity, are inherently political artifacts, influenced by the biases and agendas of their creators. The British Empire, with its vast colonial reach, implemented policies and practices that reshaped the Caribbean, focusing on the extraction of resources, the establishment of plantation economies, and the exploitation of enslaved African labor. By offering context of the creation of these maps, this tour attempts to counter the colonial gaze that traditionally defined these lands as territories to be exploited. Thank you so much for tuning into this tour. And we at the Yale Center for British Art look forward to seeing you back in New Haven when we open up in 2025. Thank you.